Hello, it's David from David Savory Electrical Services Limited, and look what I'm playing with today. It's a voltage operated earth leakage circuit breaker, or a VOLGP to use a clumsy and somewhat unpronounceable acronym. This particular one is made by Crabtree and is a rather nice example, in pretty good condition considering it's almost 40 years old. Uh, so today let's have a look at what this thing is and why they fell out of favour at the beginning of the 1980s, I think when the 15th edition wiring regulations came in, although I was only seven then so I can't be too sure about that. At first glance, this looks like a residual current device, or RCD, with its yellow test button. But unlike an RCD which operates on a current leak, this device operates on a rogue voltage appearing on the earthing. More on that later. This is rated at 500 volts, 60 amps, and is a good solid weight at over half a kilo. We have a good clunky double pole switch with a rather pleasing operation, and this rather lovely old school font that seemed to appear on everything from the 1940s to the 1980s, advising the homeowner that they should inform their electrical contractor should the test button fail to operate. Now, this particular example was sourced from a decommissioned TT installation dating back to 1980, which has now been converted to PME. And if I remove the covers, uh, you can see the top terminals where the incoming line and neutrals would have once been. There we go there, labelled N and L accordingly. And if I remove the two screws from the bottom cover, we'll see the outgoing terminals, which are labelled, in this case, N and P for neutral and phase, the uh, the old terminology of the 14th edition uh, coming out there. Uh, now notice there are two other terminals uh, under this bottom cover. These are labelled E and F. Uh, now there's a coil across these terminals and if we stick an ohmmeter, my trusty old Sinclair here, across those two terminal positions, we can hopefully see on the camera a reading of around 166 ohms across that coil. Uh, when I switch it off, notice that these two terminals E and F are actually shorted out. We're getting, uh, well, what is effectively a zero reading. If I take them off there and you can see we, uh, we start flashing to say we're open circuit. But we are closed circuit when the device is off. And when it's on, we bring the coil into play at 166 odd ohms. Um, we'll have a look at that in a bit more detail later. And on the rear of the bottom cover, which I'm sure the camera is not going to pick up at all very well, but take my word for it, um, it states that the coil has an impedance of 500 ohms and that the maximum earth resistance of the rod must be under 500 ohms. It also says the minimum tripping current is 35 milliamps. Here's how the device was designed to be installed. We have our supply from the local transformer which passes through the cutout fuse at your home, then through the double pole switch of our voltage operated earth leakage circuit breaker. From there it passes through the local fuse box and out to the load. In this case the load is a lamp with a light switch in circuit. The lamp in this example is a class 1 device and has an earth metal casing and you can see that the earth passes back through the main earthing terminal in the fuse box to, and to the coil of the Vogue via the F or frame terminal. On the other side of the coil is the E terminal we saw earlier, which connects to earth via the rod. Now let's introduce a fault onto our circuit, in this case a short between line and the earth metal casing of our lamp. We now have an earth fault loop path across line, our metallic casing, and down the circuit protective conductor back to the coil of the voltage operated earth leakage circuit breaker. This puts a potential difference across our coil, as the voltage is rising at the top of the coil with respect to the reference earth from the rod connected to the bottom of it. As the coil becomes energised, it creates a magnetic field which pulls a spring-loaded contact that causes the double pole contacts to open. This of course removes the source of supply to the faulty circuit, and rather cleverly, as it flicks into the off position, it also shorts out its own coil, leaving us now with a direct path to the earth rod. This is rather neat because it means that if our faulty circuit has any charged capacitors or if there is an alternative source of supply such as a backup generator which kicks in when power is lost then we still have an earth path to provide some protection. I'm going to test this particular model using a bench power supply just to see what sort of voltage will trip it. I've limited the, uh, the current to about 150 odd milliamps uh, just to save on some sparks uh, and of course this is DC rather than AC but we should see it do something useful as it's, if it's still mechanically sound. Now if I stick on we've got this set to 8 volts at the moment so that's our start voltage. If I tap the, the contacts there, I don't know if you can hear that on the camera uh, but you can hopefully hear it clicking away. 
and that's the coil energizing and creating a magnetic field but it isn't quite strong enough to actuate the spring release a few more volts ought to do it so let's ramp it up a bit so if i put uh, my connectors on there you can see we're drawing about 45 milliamps through the coil at the moment i'm just going to draw up the voltage until such point as it trips Jeez, makes me jump every time like this. <laughs> okay, so it tripped at around 15 and a half volts. Um, uh, so uh, when we're talking about touch voltages for metal work, uh, metal work that's not supposed to be live, such as metal casings, we generally want to keep it below 50 volts AC. And we can see that on DC supply here, this is tripping at around 15, um, 15 and a half volts. So it's a nice low voltage that it's tripping now. Going back to our circuit as designed, this all looks and sounds rather spiffing, so what's the problem and why did 15th edition do away with them? Well let's assume our class 1 light here is on the exterior wall of the building, and the point at when it goes faulty is when Doris here is in direct contact with it as she is changing the light bulb. Now we have a problem because Doris, like the rod, is in direct contact with Earth, and Doris is not an insulator. Her body has some resistance, but nonetheless there is now a potential difference across her from the point where she is touching the live metalwork to the point where she is in direct contact with the Earth. Doris may even be a better conductive path than the combined resistance of the coil and rod, in which case the majority of the fault current may pass through her instead of through the coil, and of course it takes very little current to stop your heart. In this scenario, we can't actually rely on the voltage operated earth leakage circuit breaker to actuate in a timely enough fashion, if indeed at all. The fault current may be enough to blow the fuse, but that's there to protect the wiring, not poor Doris, who's now got a potential difference right across her tits. For a safety device that is there to protect you from shock, it's not doing its job. If you were an installer of these devices back in the day, then as part of the installation procedure you would want to ensure there were no parallel paths to earth within the dwelling. The incoming water and gas services may also have been in metallic pipes that physically entered the earth and were connected to your electrical installation earthing through appliances such as the hot water tank and central heating. So steps would presumably have to be taken to isolate this pipe work from earth, although the installation I removed this device from had a bonded metallic gas pipe, which again means that in the event of a fault, the fault current may have been through the gas pipe work and not through the rod, leaving this device impotent. Now consider this scenario. Doris is still outside and mowing her lawn with her class 2 non-earthed double insulated electric lawnmower. But the silly sausage has only gone and wazzed it over the feed cable. What do you like Doris? The line conductors didn't short when the cable was cut so the fuse didn't blow and the cut cable remains live. Doris picks it up and comes into contact with live copper on the severed line conductor. Once again Doris is now part of the earth fault loop path for this circuit. So, what's our voltage operated earth leakage circuit breaker going to do about it? Well, absolutely nothing. Not a single microamp of the fault current is passing through its coil. Poor Doris is toast, and her smoking corpse will come to rest on her half mowed lawn. And this is why the residual current device is a better option in modern installations. Unlike the voltage operated earth leakage circuit breaker, which requires a connection to earth and for a fault current to pass through it in order to operate, an RCD has no connection to earth at all. An RCD effectively monitors the current going out against the current coming back, and will trip off if there is an imbalance between the two. It isn't concerned about where that current is leaking. It could be to the rod, the supplier's earth, down a copper water pipe, or through Doris as she stands on her lawn holding her severed cable. But any imbalance between feed and return current will cause it to trip. And in the case of an RCD installed for additional protection to BS61008, that trip will be in within 300 milliseconds, which should be enough to save Doris's life, although she will have to get a lawnmower repaired. Now my picture here is a little simplistic when it comes to RCDs and earth rods, as you'd normally have a time delayed RCD for fault protection on a rod with a 30 milliamp RCD for additional protection on the final circuit, but that may be for another day, and the picture illustrates the general point. So there you have it, the voltage operated earth leakage circuit breaker, and this fine example is going up on my wall. You know, I was on an event recently where other local and rather pissed up sparkers having abused the free bar were having a pop at me for having a simulated setup and a wall of interesting stuff like I was some kind of sad act or weirdo. Well I ask you, who is sadder, them for being drunk and having a laugh, or me for having a simulation environment and some interesting example pieces like this to play with? Oh, it's, uh, it's me isn't it? Yes. 
Guess I'd rather see it now. 